Hello, everyone. I am Leila Goshi, editor of Ballady Magazine, and I am so pleased to welcome today uh, Suhad Khatib, uh, who is now in Amman, Jordan, and um, we are uh, happy to welcome her today. Uh, Suhad is an Amman-based artist and designer. She is working to reverse the harm of propaganda through the through art and philosophy, one painting or study at a time. And welcome, Suhad. I'm so glad that you're with us today. Ahla sahla. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. So I've I've just admired all of your artwork that um, I've found online. And I do want to say we've known each other before from uh, St. Louis, um, where you uh, also have done important work. Um, but just for now, I think my first question is, how are you doing right now? Oof, that's the most difficult question we all ask each other naturally, but we really don't have an answer to it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm good. I'm actually, I, I'm good. Um, I, it's a combination of uh, everything that's happening right now. Yeah. Um, there's the overwhelming sadness. Uh, there's the overwhelming pride. Um, there's the overwhelming imagination. You know, I feel like my imagination is, is, is safe right now because right before October 7th, I didn't feel like my imagination was safe. But after this, um, I feel like I'm in a different place. And... Um, Every time, every time sadness gets um, more powerful than me, and uh, that happens very often these days, uh, I try to remind myself or like pacify myself with the idea, you know, we might actually be living the best time as Palestinians, but we just don't know it yet. And you know, it's okay, maybe that's why it's so painful, because it's that much more powerful than anything that we've gone through before. It is a very powerful time. And something uh, about your artwork, I have to say, uh, you know, every time, uh, you know, I have a um, something I'm thinking about, I look at one of your images and it's like you're expressing the emotion I had at one time, you know, during this uh, last five months it's been now and even before. So um, I, uh, you know, I commend you for that. I feel that you are helping to focus uh, our emotions in, uh, in some ways through your art. And uh, I really respect that. I think that's um, very good. Um, so, you know, the first uh, question I have uh, really is just what, what was your original uh, interest in art? When did you know that you wanted to be an artist? Um, people usually ask me the question, when did you start painting? And I say before I was even able to speak or walk. You know, as a kid, you learn how to draw, how to create something before you can even walk and you build up this entire story. Um, and I was, uh, I was good at drawing. You know, as a kid, that was the thing that um, interested me the most. And I was not a bad student, but I was not interested in school. But you know, you know, if I see something that interests me, I, I want to draw it and paint it. And I studied graphic design in school, but it was an art-based program. So for the first time in my life ever, I get a scholarship uh, because I was that good at it. Mm -hmm. And I participated in a lot of... Uh, you know, um, competitions here and there. I don't believe in competitions in art, but yani, that was the system. So I, I, I would usually get first or second. But I never actually considered myself an artist. I, I it felt like a very weird word when people in the family call me, oh, she's the artist. It's kind of like a cuss word. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what is that supposed to mean exactly? <laughs> oh, she's the artist. Until I think, and then I moved to the U.S. Uh, when I was 27, I moved from Amman to the U.S. And the U.S. is uh, a lot more to understand than I thought originally. 
and uh, it takes a very long time to understand and I thought I was just uh, I was lost. I didn't know that there were so many things that are pulling me in every direction to get me lost, basically. And I stopped painting for 10 years, which was now that I look back, of course, I stopped painting for 10 years in the US. But um, once I went back to painting, I remember there were a few insta instances where I'm painting. The, the, one of them is the first one after 10 years. When I saw the roots, I painted a lot of roots just from memory. I wasn't looking at photos. And I saw all these roots that are pushing just a little bit of um, a leaf, basically. Mm -hmm. I knew then that, oh, I have found my voice. I used to know how to draw, but I was not an artist. But soon here, there's like more of a voice. I, I am, I'm happy painting. Mm -hmm. And a few paintings after that, it became um, like I have to make a clear choice if I want to be an artist or not, because I started reading James Baldwin. Um, I started learning the, the uh, holy book a, a lot more. I started reading the Torah and the Injil, and I'm studying philosophy, and I'm learning that every artist in the world was called crazy at some, at some point. Mm -hmm. And every prophet that we even adore in all of our religions, they were all creatives, artists in their own way. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say, now I understand why I, I didn't accept and no, I'm an artist, but and no, you have to choose to be an artist. And no, and no, it's a commitment, you know, like when you're a doctor, you, you're committed to healing people physically. But if you're an artist, you're committed to finding something spiritual to say at times like these, like the ones like you were saying at the introduction, like that you're you're understanding the paintings because they describe some form of feeling that you're going through. And, and that was the promise that I, if I want to call myself an artist, I have to commit to that. And alhamdulillah, a lot of times it works out and it does reach people that need it at the time. But Kaman, it's not, uh, it's sometimes, it's not sometimes, all the time, it's never easy. Because when you're going through a genocide, you're going through it and you're feeling all of it and you're processing it. So you're physically tired, like you can't even paint, even if you have something to say or write, it becomes a physical labor. And, you know, it's it's nothing compared to what uh, our fam is going through in Gaza. But it's like you're channeling all of that pain. That's why it's not regular pain. It's not like, oh, I don't feel like painting today. So you're feeling so much, so intensely. And so, Yani, I'm, I'm grateful that these, Yani, I'm, I'm kind of um, achieving some of the meaning of being an artist that I um, longed for during this time. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's an honor. Well, I wanted to ask too, before we um, go into some other, um, you know, deeper topics, just uh, stepping back for a moment and, uh, tell me a little bit about your artistic style. Like, how would you define your style? And what materials um, do you normally prefer to work with? Yeah. So after I came back to painting 10 years later, I decided to start painting with ink. Um, ink, I, yani, I, I, I hold a very high spiritual value for it because ink is one of the forms that um, information and knowledge became more common to people because we used to carve in, in mountains and only specific people could see it. But when once there was ink, information was shared, you know? Mm -hmm. and I love ink because ink is so stubborn. And if you're not patient with it, if you're, if you're trying to fight with it, you, you, ink will win, <laughs> you know, on a, on a paper, it'll win. You, if you don't let things go. And letting things go helped me a lot with my own courage, you know? not only artistically and visually, but also emotionally. Like, you know, this ink that is so powerful is speaking to the water that is the source of life. And they're talking to the paper and me. So it's an honor to be in their presence, basically. Let me, let me appreciate the mistakes that are going to come and see what are the stories that are behind it. And that's why, like, in some, in some of my paintings, you see a lot of stories going on. It's because... Something told me another thing. It's like the paper and the ink is, you know, talking to you. I know it sounds crazy, but like, no. once you know you, what you're feeling and, uh, and you let the universe kind of like the tools that you have let you know. 
Um, so at some point, I, I, only, I started only painting with black ink, but at some point I felt that gold was very necessary because I started thinking a lot more about like when I'm painting martyrs, for example, I'm thinking about the ideas that they left behind, you know, not, now that they are no longer a physical presence, mm -hmm. what, is, what is the uh, intellectual value that they have left? What is the spirit basically? What is the knowledge that they have left behind? And so I started thinking of the auras around the head. Those are the ideas that they had. And I had to be, I believe in my, in my heart of heart that they're made of gold, not because gold is expensive, but because gold does not change no matter what circumstance you put it in. It lives on, you know? Yeah. And so I, I paint with black and gold. Sometimes colors invade my paintings like you saw in some of them. Uh, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for really painful uh, visual memory that I can't think of it in any other color. Um, but um, it's mainly black and gold. That is such a meaningful answer. And, um, and that's why I ask the question. I'm always curious what the relationship is between the artist and the um, materials that they use and why... Uh, why you choose the materials you do. And that is just uh, such a meaningful answer. Um, okay. And the, uh, you know, the colors that you do bring in, um, they convey emotion to me because uh, they're bold and they, um, you know, they contrast well with the, the, the black and the uh, gold. And I'm so glad you uh, mentioned that about the gold and the auras because I was going to ask you, I noticed that a lot in your work. And um, also I noticed the moon in your work. And I just wondered if there was a connection there because of the round, you know, the circular, the circular motif, I guess. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I was just having this conversation with one of my artist friends today. Um, I give art workshops. I, I founded a small studio in Amman. It's called Studio Om Janine. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a community-based art space. And I know a lot of people say it's a community-based art space, but this one is literally based on what does the community need and we build a program based on it. And it's mm -hmm. been going on for a year now, a little bit over a year. And one of the things that um, I wanted to start working with was kids, but then the moms and the friends were like, what about us? We also want workshops for ourselves. And so we start taking workshops and I hear it every time. I don't know how to paint. I'm, I don't want to come because I don't know. I'm going to drive you crazy. They think of art the same way they're um, thinking of language. You know, it's like, it's a difficult thing to learn a new language. Mm -hmm. But the reality is you know, it's a language from within. I try to tell them like, Today, we're going to draw a circle. We're going to use the ink to just draw a circle. Who doesn't know how to draw a circle? But by the end of the workshop, you'll see that eight different people in the room, for example, they all painted a circle, and none of the circles look the same. Mm. And all of the circles change based on um, whatever they're going through that week, for example. Yeah. And so when I when we talk about the circles, we keep saying that circles expand. We need to be like a circle because the sun is the circle and the moon is the circle. The universe, when it wanted to show us the most beautiful formation of anything, they chose for themselves circles, you know, because they expand and they can shrink without ever breaking. And that's how we need to be as women. Mm -hmm. But then also like. Um, as an artist with the golden spiral education, you know, they drill it into your head and then you start looking at paintings with all of these invisible lines because your eyes are so trained to do that. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing it on my formation, on my painting, how can I also connect it to my spiritual value behind the, the painting, the story behind the painting? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk about circles, those circles, eventually, all of these circles in these paintings that are representative of universal seasons, uh, earthly seasons, pain, happiness, you know, whatever it is the season for, mm -hmm. they actually connect into a spiral, a golden spiral formation. They connect to each other and then they become something. So when I started wanting to paint, I didn't know how to do it because I saw a lot of artists, they... 
uh, make a proposal to an art gallery and I'm going to paint, a bit, paint about this subject and this is what my show is going to be like. And I could never do that. I know, I know how to paint and then read all of my paintings together as, oh, that's what I was trying to learn and this is what I'm trying to say. I do it backwards. And that's why I had to have my studio in Amman because I also needed to see my paintings with the studies, with the writings that I write with them so that I am, I understand what are the things that I'm trying to study about my identity, an identity that was lost during my time living in the United States, an identity that was lost because my parents, my father was kicked out of Lid in 1948 and sur surviving a massacre. Um, a story that is uh, systematically being erased and demonized and, you know, like, I want to really know who I am. And so I did a study about the martyrs, study on truth, study on seasons. So that's where you see a lot of the, the sun and the moon, because that's seasons, it's, it's universal seasons of liberation. Um, I, 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 I painted a study about thoughts before the end during Corona. And what are the last things we can say to the world as we leave it, basically, mm -hmm. and study about theology. Uh, because I'm really interested in decolonizing my spirituality. Uh, another study about uh, Arab women's smile, because I didn't want to leave our grandmothers in those photos uh, taken by Orientalists. I want to give them the power that I want. And mm -hmm. study about self. Seven studies that I st worked on over seven years um, that now live in that studio. And, you know, that inspires a lot of the children to paint some of these paintings that they see and understand the meaning of the sun and talk about the universe and even sometimes draw UFOs <laughs> around them, you know. Yeah, that's wonderful. And just from my knowledge, because I'm not an artist um, yet, maybe someday, mm -hmm. um, but when you say study, is that like a... Um, a series of perspectives on one subject? Is that how you would define it? Um, and so you can come back to it or does it have a defined uh, period of time for a study? It's a very good question. And it goes back to the question that you asked also before, like what, what is my um, type of art? And that is a question that I'm struggling with right now. There was this, um, researcher uh, from Egypt who wanted to write about my work a while back and she was like so what art school are you from like impressionist expressionist uh -huh. uh, and I was like oh my god <laughs> I feel I feel so bad that I really never thought gave it a thought you know like I studied it all my life and then you know I wanted to create something completely different from it but I didn't know how to explain it and she was like I'm gonna put you in the comic art section and I was like, no, I'm not a comic artist. Comic. And she was like, ah, oh, no, I don't mean it by any offense. I mean, like, comic art was very revolutionary in South America and in a lot of places. And so that's what I think of it. And I was like, yeah, okay, okay. But then I was still uncomfortable with it. And I would like to define my own art on my own terms to say that it's a spiritual study. Mm -hmm. It's an identity study. It, that's... That's what this art, what is, what type of art is my art? It's an identity research, <laughs> you know, because, because um, I don't only need to paint. It's not just the visual perspective of it. I also need to write the story of this painting or how I'm feeling right now. So that, like you said, sometimes I'll go back to it, especially with theology study, because I started learning a lot of things um, more seriously and I need to not forget this. I need to build on it. And sometimes just because I know I'm not the only one who's feeling sadness over the genocide. Mm -hmm. And I want to console myself and I'm going to put it out there for anyone who needs it. They will find it. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. And I agree with you. Um, I uh, I tell oh, <laughs> how lovely. I have one too. We have a, yeah, it's not as as a this one. behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say was when I'm uh, teaching creative writing, I say something similar in that you don't want to go into writing poetry saying I'm, um, I'm this style of poet or I have to fit this structure or I failed 
you know, I, I mean, when you're first starting out, I think it's as a writer, I think it's good to just write and find your own, um, your own pattern and your own rhythm. And then yes, learn the styles, learn the, um, the structures. Of course, it's also very important just to understanding language. But so I get the, um, I feel the same way. I think, um, you know, I always ask about style just to see, you know, <laughs> but um, I do think the best uh, way forward is to find your own style first. And it sounds like that's, you know, your direction. So I can understand, I don't think comics is the right word. I understand um, illustration, but at the same time, I don't think yours is, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. If we had to choose, I would not choose that. But it, it is it is influenced by my graphic design, um, oh. my career in graphic design, my attention yes. to photography in particular. So it, it 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 does have some kind of influence like that. Um, but I really don't I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it conveys so much. Uh, well, illustration conveys emotion too, but um, I think it's on yeah different level. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, someone else can take care of naming it. I'll, I'll just right. paint for now. <laughs> right, right. So you mentioned the your um, your studio and your art classes. So, uh, and I think I've seen on social media before that you've also had um, exhibitions. Is that true of your work? Yeah. In, in and around uh, a man and. Um, have you arranged anything outside of Jordan? I know it might be difficult, um, you know, especially now. But. Yeah, well, um, so I went back to painting, I think, in uh, 2016. And in 2017, I showed one of my paintings, the very first painting in a show in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a group, uh, it was a beautiful exhibition in Montreal. And then after that, I showed in uh, San Francisco, in Berkeley, in New York, in Europe, in England, in France. And it wasn't, some of them were really big shows where like in really big art spaces and Hyper Allergic covers it and I'm published. And, and some of them were just students from universities who asked for my permission to, pin, to print some of my artwork and show it in a small venue so that they just can you know, have this moment in this space. Yeah. So um, the, that all happened up until 2019, right before Corona. I was coming here over the summer to Amman for a visit. And three days before I was coming to Amman, um, this uh, one of the gallery owners here in Amman, her, her name is Saad Isa, we um, love this woman. She randomly reached out to me. I mean, we worked with each other back in the days, but I don't think she even remembers. She was just following my art, and she was like, "When am I going to have a show for you in my in my art gallery?" I was like, um, "Coming in three days." <laughs> How about that? She's like, "Okay." So I always thought I was kidding, <laughs> and I'm like, "What? <laughs> La, come on, no, no, we'll we'll schedule it for some other time." She's like, "La, bring your print paintings with you," and so I literally packed my yani. All of that, I'm telling you, like I showed in the biggest cities around the world and like all of the beautiful spaces that I could show in. But that one made me so nervous. And no, Anna, I haven't been in Jordan in 16 years, 15 years. And now I'm coming back to the last place where I showed my artwork, but they don't remember me from those days. They, remember, they know me now. And um, what was even more shocking is that when we did the opening, the place was packed. Where did all of these people come from? It was like my my family friends, my school friends, people I don't know, people who come to the gallery itself. You know, it was just full of people. And so that was definitely a moment for me to like um, take in. Because when I went back uh, from Amman that year to San, San Francisco, I was like, I have to leave. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going to but I need to get closer to Amman. Mm -hmm. And then uh, things, uh, the reasons came together so that I can go all the way back to Amman. I thought that was impossible, but I figured a way out and I just took it. As difficult as it was, I just took it. Because I really, I felt like 
what what good am I of an artist if I am famous in a place where um, my community is not there? Mm-hmm. You know? Like, what am I doing in the United States? <laughs> you know, why am I there? And I know why I'm there. I know I'm kind of stuck there because of like the U.S. and what it does to people. But in no, I why am I not fighting actively to go back? Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing that happened when I opened Marsam Om Jinin, Studio Om Jinin, when I opened it. Uh, it was a year after I moved in. I had no idea what I wanted to do with the space more than what I told you. I just needed to see all of my paintings and studies in one place. And I did the opening and the amount of people that showed up was insane. Especially that, and I've been to a few shows over the year before that, and I've seen the openings. People don't show up to the openings. And the people who were there, there were like the aunties, my mom's friends and my mom's aunties. <laughs> and there were young people. There were old friends. There were people who were coming to Amman during the summer. So it was just full of life and full of people. And and I knew خلص, and no, and no, things, inshallah, are going to be okay. And no, everybody apparently needs the space. And we haven't done every single project that we have from poetry readings to gatherings. People show up. They just love to come. That is wonderful. I mean, art does uh, build community. It does help build community. And uh, I think it's reciprocal. So, and I, uh, you know, as I said, I think you're doing that on a much broader scale with your work right now, you know, um, during this challenging time. But that's, um, that's just so interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy for you actually to know. So, and I love the name, Om Janine. Yeah, that's very, very nice. My daughter's name is Janine. Yeah, I, so. I wanted to call it Janine's studio, and she's like, no, don't have my name on it. And I was like, okay, I'm on Janine. I can do it anyway. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's a wonderful idea. Um, I think now I'd like for us to just go through some of the images that I've noticed and just, um, you know, let you uh, explain your inspiration for them. I have a lot of ideas, but I want to hear, hear from you first, of course, the artist. So I'm going to share uh, my screen. Tablayla, um, can can you before can we can I ask you a question? Sure. How are you doing? You know, I'm I'm doing fine, and um, I would say I am channeling my emotions into productivity, such as speaking with you, <laughs> um, and um, just trying to help um, highlight. Uh, highlight the positive, um, respond, respond to emotions. I do have a lot of emotion about it. Um, it's not something I can, I can carry with me everywhere. I do have to limit um, and sort of go into a shell, you know, when I'm uh, out, you know, at work or or elsewhere. Um, just um, you know, so that I can I can still function and, and be productive myself without getting bogged down into a lot of um, you know emotional com- confrontations or conversations. So, but thank you for asking. And cool. yes, I found I found that reaching out right now to like-minded um, writers and artists uh, and anyone really. Um, who is like-minded. Um, it's just helping through this time. There will be other times to have those courageous conversations, but right now it's just too much, you know, so yeah, yeah that's where I am. So, but yes, yeah. thank you for asking. And of course, of course. So uh, what I've done, I pulled up just um, a range of, uh, your work from, I tried the last uh, few years. um, And I'm looking for my share. They closed one of my um, accounts. Oh, they did. That's why you'll see a gap between when, yeah. Yes, I wondered about that. But um, 
you know, I think uh, I think we um, have some good ones to talk about. Yeah. So um, this one caught my eye uh, immediately. Um, first, because of the children and the way you've drawn the children's faces. Um, also, because uh, this is from 2022, which is even before the most recent uh, incident in October, um, which uh, really conveys the long time struggle of Palestinians. Um, but I'm curious, what, what was your original inspiration for this and what story um, did you intend to convey in this piece? Yeah. Mahue Leila, the Palestinian story, as you well know, it's not, it didn't start on 7th of October. It started 105 years ago, to be more precise. And um, seven, the last 75 years of it um, is when um, 48, 1948 was when my father, when I started to be directly connected to this um, story, when my fa my father survived the massacre in Lid. And, um, you know, speaking with uh, my psychiatrist, uh, professor, friends, um, and then planting the idea, you know, when someone goes through something so traumatic, your genetic makeup changes. And so you deliver some of these stories through your genetics without even knowing. Mm -hmm. And I think there has there is something to do with like uh, the brutality of what my parents, my father has had to go through, what, what my aunts and my family had to go through, is that you you take any death in Palestine or anywhere for the people who are oppressed, the wretched of the earth, as Fanon calls them, you take it very seriously. You know that um, with every single death, we're losing a little bit of our humanity, you know? And what does that mean? Like, what is the future for us as a humanity, not only as Palestinians? Well, the Palestinian story, you know, from my study on it through my art, um, the one constant in it is that uh, people never stopped resisting uh, oppression. Never in these one one hundred and five years, you know there were some uh, political parties that came in. There were the the farmers who come, came in. There was this party. There was that party. But the constant is they always fought the oppression and they always fought for their land. And so this painting is from a specific time. It's from when um, two thousand twenty one happened. Saif al Quds when. Um, Habbat al um the rise of dignity, is the name of the habbat that happened then. Um, in, in 2021, there was this brutal war against uh, Gaza. And then it took me almost a year to understand the brutality of it. And then I didn't know, who do we paint? And I, I love to paint martyrs so that we know their story. We don't only listen to their stories through news channels and when, where they're counted as a number. And no, I want to see them living. I want to see them safe, you know? But and no, when you're painting children, like thousands of children that have been killed, where do you start from? And so I decided to start from the kids that were, were martyred in 2014, in the 2014 war, in 2022, so that you know, as an artist, I don't pretend like I forget, I, I do not forget about these children. I do mm. not pretend like I'm busy, you know, like la, they needed to be painting, painted. And so I started pulling up pictures of them. Sometimes it's like a passport picture. Sometimes it's like a Eid picture. Sometimes like you see them well-dressed. It's a studio picture. There's a beautiful studio behind them. And I put as many of them as I could in a painting. And my daughter passes by while I'm painting it. And I'm like, what do you see? She's like, all oh, these children look like me. Are they Palestinian? Mm. I told her, yeah. And she was like, oh. I was like, why are you sad? I didn't tell her that they were martyrs. She's like, mama, Palestinian children in paintings, they remind me of death because mm. Israelis want to kill them. And that hit me so hard. 
إنه my kid who's Palestinian she saw two things she saw that they look like her and she saw that they are in danger mm-hmm. and so that was the rest of the painting and that's why I wanted to paint the heart and the suns and the uh, clouds and um, just uh, because that those are the things that my daughter at that age which is their age almost uh, the things that she loved to see and I just wanted them to be in that happy place for a minute. Yeah, I was going to ask you about those. So thank you. That's um, that helps me understand. And um, all of the faces are just so, um, you know, compelling, and they touch me. I, you know, I had mentioned to you the one on the tricycle. I thought, yeah, the boy on the tricycle, the the boys playing soccer, calls back to the um, the oh. death of the children on the beach who are playing soccer. Um, so and, thank you for that. And I just want to say about the kid on the bicycle and all of his four siblings behind behind him. Mm-hmm. Those were the children that were taking, taking take, had, had taken the picture in the studio. And all of them, including their mom and their dad, are gone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, although this was from 2014, um, it's the same, I mean, that you pulled from that, that time period, it's the same right now, 10 years later. Um, so that, um, it's, I find it's that more very, violent than ever though, Leila. It's more, way more violent than ever. Right. Oh yes. Way more. Yeah. Way more. So thank you for that one. Um, I'm going to go to the next one. Um, This one caught my attention um, not long ago, maybe a month ago or more when I first reached out to you. Um, This was the reason. Uh, I mean, I've been thinking about it for a while, but I said I have to reach out to Suhat now that I saw this because, um, again, the emotions and um, the, uh, the strength of the woman um really also uh touched me but what was your inspiration for this um you know there was a scene i don't know if you remember it but and it's one of those scenes that uh, are imprinted into my memory uh one of the most like there there are many but one of the most the clearer ones in my head is that a huge line that they dug in the ground and they put all of these bodies in them, the mass graves after the massacres, after the genocide Mm -hmm. and how the bodies were just stacked on top of each other. um, I think it's going to be years before I actually understand any of the depths of this, but it it really hurt. It hurt badly. Mm -hmm. I, I think I went to the hospital because I couldn't breathe that night. Uh, from that scene, and and the color blue was just so present in my head. Yeah, and um, I think in more or less in in the paintings that I'm working on in Gaza right now, on yani while everything is happening in Gaza right now, is um, I'm going between yani pride and strength and you know resilience, and between absolute sadness like the deepest sadness that i've ever experienced in my life and helplessness it's sadness usually comes it comes with khalas when you've given up you you don't know what else to do and so i went to um, the holy book trying to read about sadness like what does it say and how do we deal with all of this heartache and um, every time i looked at the word huzun which means sadness in arabi in the holy book i found before it la which means don't be sad every time sadness it's not mentioned in no oh and then they were sad and no no don't be sad mm-hmm. and uh i think the very first one that i i memorized li- through my journey reading the book because i started going back to the holy book when i went back to painting and i remembered it in the story of mother mary in quran because Mother Mary, um, during labor in one of the stories in Surat Maryam, in Maryam's chapter, um, 
right before labor, she says something that really shook me the first time I really understood it. She's saying, I wish I died before this and I was completely forgotten. She was that sad. Mm -hmm. It's the level of sadness that wants you not only to die, to just be forgotten. Like, I wish I never was here. This, this level of sadness that has, it's given, she's given up completely on everything. And then the response to that, to that feeling, that, that thought that she had was, do not be sad. And it goes to explain how they can protect her spiritually and physically, not just physically, both spiritually and physically. It's kind of like the chapter is telling us about the promise that was given to Maryam and she will be okay eventually. Mm -hmm. And how she dealt with her sadness. And I couldn't... You know, I couldn't think of anything that can heal me or like help me heal with this, deal with the sadness after seeing all of these bodies. Like, did the rest of the world see what I just saw? Like, yeah. where is everyone? Like, why, 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 why hasn't the world completely stopped? All of these bodies, we saw them, they're blue, they're so strong in your face, and you want to forget about them. Like, how, how am I going to be, deal with my sadness? And I couldn't think of anything other than more profound than Mother Mary's promise. You know, mm -hmm. and maybe that's why Palestinian women are are capable of like so much, so much. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the blue, and that's what I knew immediately when I saw this. Exactly what it was. Um, because I had seen those images too. And it was just, um, you know, for me, it helped me know somebody else understands what I felt in that moment, that you understand what I felt in that moment because you created this image, you know, and- um, That's the beauty of art. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and while I'm here, do birds have a particular significance for you as well? Oh, I'm so glad you asked about the birds because I didn't want to. I, oh, I, I really <laughs> wanted to tell you about the birds. Um, this particular bird that I included, it's called Asfur Palestin, the Palestinian bird. Mm -hmm. the, they all, it's also called the sun bird, but I, I want to, I choose to call it Palestinian bird. And the reason why I love it, and I put it a lot in all of my paintings, yes, I put it in a lot of paintings um, that I work on, on martyrs, studies on martyrs in particular, because these birds, they don't only live in Palestine, even though they are called Palestine bird. They live in all the neighbor, neighboring lands, you know, and they know no borders. Mm -hmm. That's and they're free. You know, um, the I don't know if you see the bird up in the upper corner of this screen. Yeah, that uh, was drawn by uh, Aya Ganame. Um, she did the um, banner art for the Valadi site. And um, I asked her to draw a sunbird. I sent her a picture. So that's her version of a sunbird too. So very coincidental, I think. Um, and that's why I ask you, I love birds too. So. It's kind of like the spiral that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, like all of the ideas are, are going in the in the right direction. Like we're connecting spiritually. I don't think it's a coincidence. Right. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the next one. I began to understand miracles. I found this so um, powerful on so many levels. Um, you know, the, the toy soldiers and um, the the gold behind, I don't know if that's now the moon or, as you said, the thoughts. But for me, this just signifies a great, a great change. And so I wonder how you came to paint this. What was your inspiration? I don't, I smile when I see this painting because I feel like I'm being, you know, resilient. <laughs> <coughs> because, um, you know, this image is an image of um, this uh, truck. What is it called? This um, bulldozer. machine bulldozer. Yeah, this bulldozer breaking down 
borders and walls. If it had been in any European country, not mentioning anyone, singling anyone out, it would be a moment that humanity would celebrate. It would go into history as the most important human memory ever because it's tearing down walls. Right. But what like actually wall. happened, yeah. it was demonized. It, yeah. was, it was demonized. It was like, like it was erased. Actually, if you post a picture of that, that this particular moment in photos, it will be more less than 10 seconds before they delete it, at least for, and for my account, that has been the case. You are not allowed to see it anymore. And so I was like, well, I am Palestinian. I am the protector of this moment. I'm going to paint it, and I'm going to paint it the way I see it. The big sun in the middle of the night, we say in Arabic, <laughs> you know, we will show them stars at night. Mm -hmm. it, and the, don't mess with us. We will show you stars at night, <laughs> you know. And that's what I felt like, you know, a big star is coming up in, on this particular night. And, and, it's, and we were the ones who were able to tear down the walls and free humanity from these walls and these borders. And it turns out that the army on the opposite side is nothing more than toy soldiers. Otherwise, we would not have been able to get 30, 30 kilometers back in one day. Yeah. And one of my friends from Gaza called me on the day this happened, on the day the massacres start. When the genocide had taken place, I became very confused. Like, we just won, but also we're being massacred en masse. خلص. It's a constant, it's, Gaza has always been a concentration camp. This is an active concentration camp. خلص. It's in, 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 in erasure mode. And so I'm like, I can't think of our victory yesterday, and I have to jump on what are, what are we, how are we going to stop this? And my friend uh, from Gaza called, and he was like, Anna, I feel so proud. You know, I belong to Gaza and the youth in Gaza who, and the generation that was able to get back the 30 kilometers that my father my, was pushed out of 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. 75 years ago, he's like, my dad had to walk those 30 kilometers under gunpoint. And now these kids with no shoes, with very yani, minimal, some of them had sticks and hammers, <laughs> you know, they mm -hmm. were able to break the most vicious wall in our history, in our human history, a wall of a concentration camp. And they don't want us to celebrate that or remember it. Mm -hmm. And I let them block me. They closed one of my accounts when I posted uh, something like this. I was like, okay, we'll start another account, Yani, as long as we don't stop saying our truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, um, you know, it did. Uh, I thought of all of that. And in regard to the rest of your work, um, I feel like just what we've been talking about. Um, you started from 2014. Uh, maybe you have some images from even before that that you've drawn, but your work shows this progression, you know, the children, and um, there's one about Ezzedine that we'll see in a moment, um, and others that lead up to this moment. And you can't understand this moment without uh, understanding those other images too. And so um, I did find this very powerful. And also, you know, I've, I've come to realize something from this whole thing. The bulldozer, you know, first the bulldozer is used to tear down uh, Palestinian homes. You know, Palestinian homes are, are destroyed, you know, for very, you know, uh, illogical reasons, or maybe one person, the family, you know, gets in trouble and the whole house is destroyed. So the bulldozer has been a symbol of fear, you know, for Palestinians too. And then now to use a bulldozer, but then now it's being used again against Palestinians. So um, I don't know what, what we mean by that, but it, it made me aware of that uh, machine 
and it's really supposed to be used for good purposes and you know here we are so there's a lot to say about this one image so thank you for this one um the next one it's but also i'm gonna say about your last point because it's oh. uh, it's about choice mm -hmm. a tool is a tool what do you do with it and for what and palestinians now are showing the world that they can use the same tools to protect life rather than to destroy it mm -hmm. yeah they have worked, Zionism has worked on building all these campaigns and all of these, um, you know, PR campaigns and school funds and music uh, uh, collaborations and all of that. It all fell apart in that moment. Mm -hmm. In that moment, that huge machine broke down a concentration camp wall. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, it's just... <laughs> We could you. write a book just on that image right there. So probably somebody is. But. Yeah, let, um, I let them do that. <laughs> I'll just keep painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but this one was a precursor, and this um, also just uh, really um, impacted me. I'm not familiar with this particular uh, situation, or I don't know if you is just from your imagination, but. But the idea of, um, yeah, the idea of it really struck me. So what was your inspiration? Yeah, uh, this painting, um, I saw it in uh, a video, actually, uh, that was posted at the time, um, um, as the Dean is a martyr. And on the day he was killed, he was not in his neighborhood. Uh, but the Hajjah in the house, she saw him and she did not want him to die alone. Even though there was a lot of shotguns outside, she didn't care. She went downstairs, she patted him, uh, covered his head, covered him up with a blanket and told him, مع السلامة يا mm. Goodbye, mom. You know, she didn't know his name probably even. But she called him, good, good, she's saying, goodbye, child, basically. Mm -hmm. She didn't want him to die alone. And so I, I just needed to paint it because uh, he was assassinated while he was alone in the street, on the street, in a neighborhood where he wasn't, just because mm -hmm. he's Palestinian. But then he did not die alone like they wanted for him to die alone because of um, the community's big heart. And courage as well, yeah. and, and that's also, um, you know, um, about um, talking about like feminist movements and what is the role of the woman. And I feel like in the Palestinian story, it just it's it's there. You know, like you don't need a movement and an office and an institution and you know um, bureaucracy. Like our moms are the 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 most important feminist movement the world has ever seen. You know, like our our grandmothers are. You know, there's so much that they, yani when you talk to, when you see a martyr's mom break into Zagharid, uh, ululation, when the news arrives of her of her son's death, mm -hmm. it means that she's fighting sadness. Remember how we were saying now in a, in a do not be sad? Mm -hmm. They're fighting sadness so that they don't give up. Yeah. And I, so I just, I wanted to paint it. I know she's not his mother, but you no, know, thank God she was there in that moment so that we are not heartbroken that he died alone. And the courage to go out in the street right after someone has been shot and yes. don't know what- And we see this in Gaza a lot. We've seen it in Gaza so many times and they were all women, by the way. Right, exactly. And if I can ask one more thing, I, I'm thinking of the goal now is like um, maybe their thoughts leaving or I don't know. It's, it was his blood in the picture. There was uh, blood. Okay. And I wanted to turn the blood into seeds that fly. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this one too. Uh, this, uh, a lot to say about this one. 
um, the key and the sun. Um, so where did this come from? You know, um, you know, I organized in the U.S. Um, um, during Ferguson, um, mm -hmm. the uprising. And um, we used to always say, you know, like we're working on solidarity and we want to talk about our stories and share our stories. And sometimes people are asking you, like, what does it have to do with this Palestine have to do with me? And then you go into the Palestinian community and they say, what, what do I have to do with the black struggle? You know, like we were, that what you're talking about 2004, it was in the early stages, you know, when we started breaking that narrative, that system. So it was, it was tough. And then one day, one of my friends sends me this map of Africa and he's like, here's Africa. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like this summarizes everything that we've been trying to simplify to our communities. Yeah. And no, uh, this is the way a black man in the United States sees Africa. And I'm like, of course, Mahue, there is no division on a land perspective. Yes, there is the Red Sea, but then the connection becomes Palestine. It didn't only help me to understand what do you say to people who tell you what do we have with each other? It also taught me as a Palestinian that you know, Palestine has to be free in order for Africa to be free. Mm -hmm. And if you are able as a colonizer to control Palestine, you're able to control the rest of Africa. You're controlling the door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you control the Arab speaking world all the way from Yemen to uh, Morocco or the Sahara al Gharbiya, then um, you can control the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen what happened in Yemen, for example. You know, like it's it's very basic with very yani, minimal um, capabilities, paralyzing the entire world uh, trade uh, businesses. Right. And so that's when where this came from eventually. And you know, mm -hmm. Palestine is the key to the map, is the key to Africa. And Africa is the key to Asia. And neither one of them are going to be free if Palestine is not free. Yeah. And the large gold. Um, That's where the sun comes in. That's where right. the seasons come in. Yeah. It's only a matter of seasons. Mm -hmm. We have not lost. We have not given up on our land. We will go back. We will have sovereignty. Uh, we will have uh, um, everything that we need. Yeah. But it's only a matter of seasons and and you know us keeping keep it keeping to keep on and you know i love this idea too of no borders um because um you don't need borders to have your home i don't i don't know if i'm saying that right but that's that's really the concept i'm working with with validity it's the indigeneity it's not where does the line end or who's controlling the line. You know, it's a just um, can you live as as you want to live in the region, you know, of your ancestors. And yeah, there's a lot. Um, yeah. One of the most uh, interesting um, things I learned about, especially the borders, in the in in this area, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, is that for hundreds of and hundreds of years during the Ottoman Empire, in order for them to be accepted, even though they are the colonizer, yani the occupier at the time, but in order to be accepted, they never broke the flow between the cities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when they did create borders, they were not they were not vertical; they were horizontal borders. And mm -hmm. so here in Jordan, for example, you see it so clearly between Nablus and Salt. Salt is on the Jordanian side and Nablus is on the Palestinian side. You see it between Karak and Khalil. Again, Karak is on the Jordanian. You see the architecture is similar, the traditions are similar, the food, because they're connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And then Churchill came and he cut between Jordan, between those two cities, Amman and, and Jerusalem, cut it vertically. And this became a land, and that became a land. 
without taking into consideration the flow of communities in the space. So, for yeah. example, the Bedouins in the south, they go all the way from Yemen to Egypt. They never have to, uh, to you know, go in with a passport or whatever. And now this is from this country, this, the same families from this country and the same families from the other country. And so when colonizers come in, they never put the the border that we need, even even if they do, they, they put the border that they need. So, yeah. and honestly, like right now with everything that's happening, since everything's crazy around us, you know, and I find it absolutely normal to think about what is the concept of a country? Like all of these concepts around us have failed. Even the United States as a country has failed. So yeah. why are we so desperately trying to find a country and put borders to it and put the armies to protect the borders? And then when a genocide happens, you find that nobody has sovereignty over any borders. Yeah, I I completely agree. Um, you know, I've been very uh, just repeatedly questioning the the use of borders and um, just um, how much energy we put into them and how much heartache comes from them. And yeah, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for that new direction really. And really even probably going back, I remember of my parents' generation, um, I remember hearing stories about like a cab driver, um, even when there were borders, but they would drive between um, Damascus, Amman, Jerusalem, uh, Beirut, you know, taking people on long trips. Um, and uh, and then the borders got tighter. But imagine that where you could just say, can, you know, buy a ticket for a private car to take you to, you know, Beirut. That is impossible today. You know, yeah. so. Um, but, you know, hopefully um, we'll. Um, We're on our path. New path. We're on our path to regain path. all of that. <laughs> right. So the next one, um, this one uh, caught my attention because of the the cats, um, really. And of course, the um, the you know, I guess uh, fighter. I guess I'll say. Um, but the you know, in so many social media posts of Gaza, I see people interacting with cats and. Um, just in the midst of all of that, people still have this kindness for the cat, you know, or for the, for nature, you know, and maybe drawing some strength from that. So, yeah, your thoughts or your inspiration. Oh, Leila, how, how can I even put into the, this into words? You know, I know the first time I visited Palestine, it was in 2013. And uh, because my family's last interaction with the, yeah, I mean, with their city and with that surrounding was the massacre, uh, they were hesitant, Yani, you know, are you sure you want to go? They were scared. And then there was like people who were scared and didn't want me to go. There were other people who were like, La, you know, you're normalizing when you go through the border. And then there were the other people like, oh, you're so lucky. But the reality is that going there to Palestine has taught me things. There was no way for me to learn them otherwise. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just things in Namsanan, this is what happened here. It's not his, historical things only. It's like things that you feel that you cannot feel anywhere else. Like the first time I saw Al-Aqsa, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not, not a religious uh, need that made me feel that way. La, and no, there is presence there. There's like, it's me and my Catholic friend, Italian Catholic friend. We both felt like, oh, I can see God's power in this place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't anything to do with your religion it has to do with your spirituality mm -hmm. and so how is anyone going to explain that to me what photo in the world is going I like literally the first time I saw it I didn't know I was going to see it my knees collapsed I just went on the floor it's like there is like grandeur here that I can't I can't stand on my legs yeah. And then you walk around Khalil and someone points points to a wall and they're like, oh, yeah, that wall is 5,000 years old. It's, it's People say it goes all the way to Abraham. 
and then you know you see the birds and the trees and mountains and mountains of trees and you're like wow this all belongs to me and i don't even i'm not even allowed to go to it mm -hmm. one of the most sinister and scary things that i saw there that i would have not learned unless i went there is the mountains and mountains of uh, pine nut trees and i was like why is there so many pine nut trees and no is it the yani our nature they're like no this is what the europeans brought with them from europe those kinds of trees mm -hmm. and they brought them because they're evergreen because they kill any tree in its way and they cover up all of the destroyed palestinian villages mm -hmm. and to destroy it. they need to cover up on that the only tree that can stand in the way of a pine nut tree is the cactus tree so mm -hmm. even though there's a jewish national fund in the us that's funding it with a dollar for a tree even though like the yani there's a very uh, proper a systematic plan to destroy the ecosystem in specific areas so that the massacres are covered up even though some of the birds the natural birds like the hudhud have 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 gone extinct because of these trees and yeah. when a fire catches on they don't know how to turn it off because it does not belong there kind of like the eucalyptus trees in the united states mm -hmm. even though all of these things that exist that yani have have shown themselves so strongly on this land the cactus tree can still stand against it mm -hmm. and every village you know, uh, on the corners of every Palestinian village, they used to plant cactus trees. And so you see it so clearly. And so I'm mentioning the story to say that Palestinians um, know their land. You know, like they don't get skin cancer from the sun, mm -hmm. <laughs> like Europeans do. Uh, they know how to plant a, um, a fig tree in a, a a land that has a lot of olive trees. They know the connection between the things so that they don't add pesticides, they don't overdo it with, you know, chemicals, so that they don't... Can you hear me? Oh, yes. And no, they know how to protect the land. And so even when a massacre, now what you're seeing, what you mentioned, even when there's a genocide going on, the house is destroyed, cultural spaces destroyed, spiritual spaces destroyed, people killed, families erased. Whenever there is life, they protect it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a dog, whether it's a cat, whether it's a fish, and you see it constantly because it's their land. They care about it. Mm -hmm. There was a video that I saw the other day basically saying, you know, when occupiers uh, don't belong to a land, they force it to become theirs, but they wish, they wish it was theirs, but, but it's not. And I don't know if you saw in 2021, the Ravens, they were picking on the flag and everyone was like, See, we told you. <laughs> All right, I remember that. Um, and we're coming to an image of a, a Raven or a, or a crow, so um, uh, maybe that's uh, one inspiration. In fact, let me, go to that one. I think it's next. Yes. I've noticed you, um, you use ravens uh, in your work occasionally. Um, and this one is called broken wing. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what was your inspiration for this one? I ravens in in the culture I grew up in was a kind of like a pessimistic uh, bird ravens and owls mm -hmm. and that was very curious to me like why those two birds like why why are they a bad omen and um i started studying both but more ravens than owls because ravens were very present in the space that i was in particularly after i moved to california in the last seven years i was in the states mm -hmm. um ravens are the smartest birds they don't only take care of each other. They take care of other birds around them. I, I've watched them like give different signals to different birds. But uh, historically speaking, the first um, creature, according to the um, 
to the holy books, it's the one who taught us how to bury our dead. Uh, so that's why I thought maybe people think of it with omen. It's because it's connected to death. It's teaching us something about death. Oh. And when you leave the bodies out, bring them back to the land. They belong to the land. They came from it and they'll go back to it. And I think that is one of the most profound lessons humanity has ever learned. Mm -hmm. Like It's not like when we discovered the cycle you know and how that uh, was uh, a turning point for us uh, on a physical and uh, material way this bird taught us something spiritual don't leave your dead out bury bring them back to the land and so you know whenever i go through difficult times i feel like what would a smart raven tell me <laughs> about death? that's great that's great and in this case, his wing is broken because? Yeah, but right before October 7, I um, I was not in a good place. I felt like, um, like I felt defeated, to be honest. I felt like um, nobody cares about the Palestinian um, story anymore. We're never going to go back home. It's, it's over. Um, you know, I saw the dysfunctionality all around me. I saw good people not being appreciated for their work. I saw women struggling in this life, not go, knowing how to break cycles. Um, and so I felt like we were like the raven, those who were around me that I, I, you know, I respect and I find beautiful. And I felt that they have broken wings. You know, they're unable to fly in this place. So I was portraying the state of mind right before October 7. And then, you know, I don't know about the rest of the world, but there's definitely two of me, one before October 7 and one after, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a wonderful, um, it is a wonderful image. And uh, now that you've explained everything, uh, the meaning behind the raven, and um, just the place you were in at that time. So thank you. Yeah. Um, this one I I uh, understood, I think. Uh, but tell me your your thoughts as you were uh, creating this one. La, this one and there's like a series of them. Um, a few of them that I, I just couldn't see anything but red. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it was after the Mamadani. Uh, genocide um i think i'm pretty sure this was <clears throat> in the days after because that completely um just destroyed me um yeah. for hundreds and hundreds of us to die in a hospital that was declared safe and then still be killed in a second yeah uh was like just one of those moments like ah uh, yani Thank, thank you, world, for letting me know who you are. But and now I have a lot of work to do. Like I was depending on your humanity. I don't see it. So, <clears throat> and there were videos at the time, uh, not of that particular incident, but like videos that we we were watching. This live streamed all day long. Um, you can't watch anything else, Yani. But people running and. Uh, yeah, I just needed to document uh, the, this running, this this panic. It, try to understand it. I'll never be able to understand it. Yani, in that moment, but you no, know, I just didn't want it to get lost. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to the next one too because it um, is from a, a two, 2022. Um, and yes, uh, your your meaning behind this painting. You know, um, uh, one of the things that I think was lost for me in exile or diaspora, whatever you want to call it, is that um, farmer, that like little that little inside farmer inside of me. You know, like my mom is a far comes from a family of fallahin. You know how like Palestinians have the midden and the fallahin, mm -hmm. and you know, so I'm half fallahi. But because I grew up in cities, concrete cities, one after another after another, I think I lost that connection to the land. And so um, I get jealous sometimes when I see my friends going to Jiddu Zetun, you know, to harvest Zetun. 
And, um, but I thought, okay, I can't do it, but it doesn't mean that I can't celebrate it or talk about it every time it happens so that it becomes a tradition for me as well, but in a different way until, you know, I figure a way to go back to land. Yeah. So that was, that was, uh, that was it. Um, and the sunbirds are there too. And the poppy flowers are there too. And the poppy flowers, they have a yeah, any big significance. Let them know. They're so beautiful. And there's so many of them in this land during the summer. It's it, it's just like a sight to behold. And they come out on the, their own. As soon as you pluck them, they die. You have to keep them in land to live. To live. Wow. Yeah. And so these are poppy flowers because I thought for a moment, uh, pomegranates, I wasn't sure. Um, but I'm glad you said that, Poppy. And then there is the, um, to me, like a symbol of, of blood. I'm just explaining how I'm perceiving it. And so I saw it as a um, sort of a strength of staying with the land no matter what. And yeah. so it, it has that image to me as well. But I love that idea. Um, it's very beautiful. You know, like we water the land with our blood, and no, as long as you know the land is okay, and no, we're willing to give it everything. And so that's why, come on, and I love the poppy flowers because we, yani, some people say, and no, no, those are the martyrs blooming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. And this is uh, the last image. There's so many more, um, but uh, you were mentioning to me the difference in uh, translation of the name. So would you like to explain this one more? Hello, this one, um, it came out uh, in red. I don't, I, yani, it, it came out in red. I just saw that it had to be in red because I'm talking about the return of the poppy flower seasons poppy flowers we were just talking about mm -hmm. um, it, 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 in Arabic or they have different names and I picked this particular one because Hanun in Arabic means you know the warm and kind mm -hmm. and so I wanted it to be to have a kind meaning because this particular study is um, the, the poetry that I wrote with it um, the study that I wrote with it came out as poetry. And it was from an intense conversation I had with a couple of my friends about the, the necessity of not, you know, uh, thinking that maybe we will return and not let's start thinking and know what does return actually mean. Mm -hmm. And one of the most shocking thing in that conversation is that I drew a blank. I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I don't have anything to build off of. Like I have to build completely from my imagination. My imagination is not functioning in that direction because of, I don't know, propaganda, time, fear. I don't know. I had to unpack all of these things. And it was a very intense conversation. And it was during that time where like the massacres are happening back to back and my health is not helping. My asthma is like really strong. And we dropped it completely after that. Like, I never want to talk about this right now. But then it stayed in the back of my mind. And no, uh, well, and I'm an artist. Why am I? And I'm, I'm studying the Palestinian story. Why am I blocking out on the return part? And there are really important questions I need to be asking myself now. Why? And uh, where am I going to go to? Why am I afraid? Uh, so many questions. Internal and external. So I painted this one thinking, and no, uh, I'll start by imagining it with a small little poem. <laughs> and uh, I'll just imagine, and no, uh, and uh, now I know the street names. And uh, if I go back, I'll go, the street, I know the street names, which means, and uh, I can move. So that's something I really want in Palestine. Like we were saying about like movement going from one city to one city. I was thinking, you know, I am from Lid. I don't want to pick any other city to go back to. I want to go to Lid because anyway, none of the people who lived in Lid are in Lid anymore. Like so many other people from different cities are there now. 
And because I'm greedy, <laughs> I wanted to have a little studio in Yafa because oh. it's very close to Lid. And this way I can go every day between the two and maybe it'll be by the, the sea. Who knows, you know? Yeah. And this way I can be in both places because there's nowhere else I'd rather be, basically. I'll and, visit uh, when you're there. Oh, oh, yeah, of course you will. So, Allah, yeah. But Kuni, you'll be my neighbor. <laughs> you know, this is reminding me, I could not decide if, um, I should have asked you before if I should put the, um, the um, what I want to say, the reflections with the images. But do you mind if I pull up the poem now? I I have uh, Instagram up and I can pull up the poem. Would you like to read it in Arabic and then? Yeah, I think the translation is going to be rough because it's in uh, slang Arabic. It's not in uh, classical Arabic. Okay. Plus maybe for the Arab speakers, we can give them that one as a yeah, gift. For the Arab <laughs> speakers and then, um, you know, we'll we'll see what we can do. Even though it won't be great, um, here I'm not sure if you can see this. Let, let me pull it up on my phone because it's easier okay. to read. Okay, I'll keep it here. Um, yeah, just, for, uh, for anyone who needs it. Yeah. yeah. In fact, if you're going to do that, uh, maybe I should um, do the translation, even though it's not great. Okay. It will give folks uh, just an idea of what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the poem says, El Mawdu'a Mabtout, Rah Arja'a Falastin. Ya salam, ya nas, Bisir Adkhulha, Bidun la visa, Wala tasrih, Wala istijwabat, Wala hawajiz, Wala hadud. O Bisir Araf Asma al-Shawari'a wa Ahali al-Biyut. O Andi Shakka Gurfitain wa Balkona bil-Lid. ومرسم صغير بيافا على الشط بزوره كل يوم وبعرف بنتي جنين على جنين وعلى أهلها المقاومين طيبين وبزرع لها هناك شجر ليمون الموضوع مبتوت رح أرجع على فلسطين وبزور مع أمي طول كرم من روح بتنكتين تنكت زيت وتنكت زيتون وأنا راجعة بشوف الجدار مهدوم والحواجز احترقت والمي دفقت وتعبت العيون والعائدين مثل كتير مطمئنين فش هون لا مخيمات ولا لاجئين والأرض ملان خير وزهر الحنون الموضوع مبتوت رح نرجع على فلسطين That's lovely. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for reading that. Uh, and for those who are interested, uh, your uh, many of your other images have reflections with them as well on your Instagram. Uh, so that's definitely something to go and see. Um, and that reminds me, you are um, developing a book. Is that right? A collection of your work? Yes. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, yes, yes. This is the first time I publicly talk about it. I think everybody around me, I've driven them already, driven them crazy about it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in this moment, like we said a few minutes ago, like you don't know your, yani, what is your role in all of this? Um, mm -hmm. You can be debilitated by the sadness and end up in a hospital like I did every other week. Uh, for months, or you can find something to do, like you were saying, like you keep yourself productive, you keep yourself going. And I can't claim that I know anything about anything, but you know, the things that I know how to do, I'm going to try to put them together to um, make something of this moment that I, I can look back at and say, at least I tried, at mm -hmm. least I tried something. Mm -hmm. and so... Over the past seven years, I've been trying to learn the Palestinian story, to have like roots in the Palestinian story. And some of the martyrs I painted, I sent the paintings to their moms. And some of them sent me a uh, mirami, a sage to the marsam, you know, from, from Jenny and different other places. So there became a, a full life behind that painting, right? And communities that are being formed after, behind that, those paintings. And so I was thinking, and no, I want to put all of these studies, those reflections, the things that I'm studying in them, I want to put them together, the chapter about Gaza, 
the chapter about Jerusalem, the chapter about Nakbe, what, what happened back then, and the chapter about how do you resist all of this. And the last one is we don't know anything about war. That's the name, the title of the chapter. So it's five chapters about they, you know, some of them are in Arabic, the writings, the reflections, some of them are in Arabic and others are in English. Because when I first started to paint, picking a language to write with was such a difficult um, question for me because I don't, I had stopped using Arabic as my main language, even though it is the main language in my head. Uh, so I'm neither good in, at this or neither good at that. But so now I have to start writing. I don't want to stop uh, because of it. And I thought, oh, you know, it's uh, English is my occupier's language. If I mess it up, like, who cares? <laughs> if I mess up my Arabic, my mom is going to take this very personal. She's an Arabic teacher. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, she studied yeah. Arabic. Mm -hmm. She doesn't practice it, but she studied it. And then my Arabic teachers are going to be mad at me because they always thought I had potential to be to be a good writer. I just never cared about like the ba the rules of the language, you know, like I just couldn't yeah. pay attention to it. And so I started writing in English. And in this book, I'm going to keep the English pieces in English and the Arabic pieces in Arabic. And, you know, keep both of them and even have the content page in the middle. Like there's no beginning and no end to this book. It's just stories about martyrs, about uh, Palestinian beauty, Palestinian love, Palestinian resistance, all of the things that make us up, Yani, that I have found in the past seven years, and I'm still finding so much beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to publish it because I feel like it's necessary right now, because a lot of people, they, they want to either reconnect with their identity or want to learn the story yani, sincere, sin sincerely. Right. And I just want to make it available. Mm -hmm. So, hopefully, you know, hopefully something will come together. I'm going to self-publish it too because I didn't want to go through the regular channels and go to festivals that I don't want to go to because they think big names is, you know, a great thing to me. it's It just makes me queasy. Like, I want to be in communities and small bookstores here and there, you know, come back to St. Louis for a read, go to California for a read. Right. Um, so, you know, I'm figuring all of it out, but it's coming together and hopefully it's going to come together soon, inshallah. I look forward to reading it. Um, and definitely you'll have to come back um, and talk about it once yeah. uh, everything's put together. So, yeah. Um, and yes, hopefully I'll, you'll bring it to St. Louis or who knows. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. So um, I just wanted to, yeah, we discussed everything. Um, so just final thoughts. Do you have any um, other upcoming events uh, in Amman or elsewhere that um, you'd like to share or any final thoughts you'd like to say about, about your work today? Uh, first thing I want to say is that it's been incredibly amazing to reconnect with you. Oh, I'm so glad that, to have this conversation with you right now. Me too. And I want to say something that, you know, you, you might cringe for a second, but I want to say to whoever hears this, uh, hears us today, and know, uh, thank you, Leila, for always giving me space and for always believing in me. The last time we met, you invited me to... Um, a space where, you know, you had a lot of your students in there. And um, I was not an artist. I was not, nobody knew about who I was at the time. You just thought I was feisty enough. And you were like, yes, bring that feisty lady with a really stubborn head. <laughs> and you gave me space. And I, I felt like so welcomed in that space. For, you know, for us to connect during these times, it makes me feel like I'm I'm not wrong about the spiral of things, like we're moving into bigger circles and bigger networks. So, so grateful to have this conversation with you today. Anjat, yeah, and from the bottom of my heart. Well, during that time, uh, your voice was very important and very beneficial to a lot of people who learned a lot from you in just one hour, you know, of your yeah. your experiences uh, in Palestine and um, just your your uh, presence, I think, helped people learn about Palestinians. Um, so, yes, thank you for that. And, 
Yeah, so and, um, and the second thing I want to say, sorry to interrupt, but before I have to say this before I leave. <clears throat> Everything that has happened in Gaza, the entire genocide that has been taking place, you know, for 105 years, up until 130 days ago, is one thing. And what could potentially happen in Rafah in the next few days is a whole different thing. Right. It, yani, I can't stress how important it is for us, for anyone who can do anything about it, to take action as soon as possible. Because, you know, it's not only going to impact Palestine or Palestinians, it's going to impact our humanity, our existence on this planet. If we let people with from the, from the uh, war industrial complex go on with killing people who are living in tents, in 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 Rafah, in the way Rafah is right now, we have lost we have lost completely our humanity. I don't think we will be able to recover from that as a humanity. And so, anyone who can um, come up with campaigns, I, me, and my friends are hopefully going to launch a campaign soon. I'll talk to you more about it if you know uh, things come together. Sure. But I think we should put all of our resources, financial, emotional, spiritual, communal, everything, we have to put it towards protecting Gaza and particularly Rafah. We need a human corridor. We need end of the aggression, not just a ceasefire. We need an end to the aggression. And we need to know that people are going to be okay. They need to be get... Uh, um, to hospitals, they need to get proper me medicine. We we need to bring life back because this is inhumane. It's inhumane. It just, yeah, we have reached the end if we can't figure this out. I, I just wanted to say that. Thank you for saying that. Um, I I have a similar message I uh, want to say, but before that. Um, as you were speaking, I realized that I think we first met 10 years ago during 2014, before Ferguson, the summer of 2014, when there um, was a terrible uh, uh, Israelis bombed Gaza, and it was terrible then. Um, and it's even more terrible now. Um, so just thinking about that, that cycle, we, we seem to be coming to um, uh, a very terrible break point. Um, yeah. But I was going to say, just to follow up with everything you said, which I agree, um, if you are in the US, um, you know, please call your uh, representatives, your political representatives, whether they're local, state, or national, and um, just, uh, you know, as you said, join campaigns, do anything to just stop the killing. Yeah, I don't believe in representatives anymore, Leila. I it's know. No. Your calls, and I was in the. I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen. It's a waste of my. It's a waste of my time to do any of that. We need to come up. We need to to ignite our imagination. Yeah. If people can travel, if they have the means to travel, let them go. Let them, you know, get anywhere nearby. You know. Maybe, yeah. maybe the borders will open and people are going to be needed. We'll talk about campaigns. I'll send you more information about that. Yeah. But, you know, calling representatives, and I understand totally why you're saying that. But you know, where are they? Yeah. Oh, I know. It's, it's every avenue. And by saying that, believe me, I will no longer. I'm. I'm no longer voting for a national party. If anything, I'll vote for the uh, Green Party, just as a you know symbolic. Exactly. Uh, right, because um, it is, uh, it's clearly, the, the system is clearly broken um, if we can allow this um, situation to occur right in front of our eyes. Um, so, yes. But at the same time, um, every, I agree with everything you said, and also I say that because every avenue until until there's no avenue to use, you know. Understood. Understood. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so, um, but thank you everyone who has been here today and thank you, Suhad. I'm sure we will talk again um, and I look forward to reading your book. I would love that. I would love that. I'll definitely send you a copy. If you come visit me in Amman. Okay, I will. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Please take care and thank you for everyone who is with us. Thank you. Good night.